Thanks. All right. Uh, oh, I, I still have one more minute bonus. That's, that's awesome. Ah, it's gone. All right. <laughs> so thanks so much for having me. I'm really super excited to be here. Uh, thanks a lot for Ming and George and Laura and Hudson and all the other helpers. Uh, please give them a hand because uh, I think this is a very unique uh, occasion here and you're making it possible. Thank you so much. So I'm talking about smart contracts as parameterization and I realized um, when I was running the presentation by Christian uh, Reitwiesner that he wasn't really sure what it means, so <laughs> I guess he's not the only one, but I am going to try my best to explain exactly that. So I'm Henning Dietrich, I'm working at IBM, I'm working in the project Blue Horizon, and uh, we are, I'm, I'm very proud that we're actually really having a product there that is using the blockchain. Uh, it's not just a project, it's something that is actually ready for production. So, and I'm also writing a book about Ethereum and uh, having uh, as a subtitle Ethereum for non-technical people. And one of the things that I'm taking aim is that the distributed ledger talk is something that is very confusing and that is giving people the wrong idea what to look at uh, when they're looking for ideas for blockchain. So people like this distributed ledger thing because the ledger is something that's around for a long time and the blockchain obviously has a lot of uh, very good uh, features that make it uh, a very good distributed ledger. However, there's completely the wrong track and where you actually should look on is the guarantee of execution because that's the reason why, for example, Bitcoin is worth something. It's not just because it couldn't be duplicated in the past or you can't duplicate it now. It's because nobody will be able to duplicate them going into the future. That's why they have a value. And um, if we look at Ethereum as the world computer, it's also something where you think of moving cogs, right? I mean, if you, you put something into uh, a transaction and it's going to 8,000 computers and is uh, changing bits and bytes there. So um, it's not a world ledger that we're talking about. Although, on the other hand, uh, that's the URL for my book. Um, if you try to really get your head around it, you look at stuff from different angles. And that's also what I'm trying to do in my book. Is, is, uh, I'll, I'm explaining where you could actually uh, have, by taking a different view, have a different insight. And this is something uh, in games development, there is the book, so to say, about how you design games. It's called Book of Lenses, so I'm, I, I'm not inventing this. Um, and of course, if you look at Bitcoin, in the end, what you want to know is what's the balance of my account, of my Bitcoin account? But where are the smart contracts there? So there's the question, of course, are smart contracts really something that you can do with Bitcoin? And we're on an Ethereum conference here, so I can be critical. Um, and what you can do is multisig with Bitcoin, right? And then everything that goes beyond that, you can put a hash in the blockchain in Bitcoin. And then you can say, okay, but I have clients that all agree that a certain hash is going to mean a certain code and how they get that code doesn't matter. And then they're going to execute it. And that's as good as, as having the code on chain. However, um, and I, I owe that to Joe Latoni, one uh, researcher, like the earliest researcher at IBM that who was looking into Bitcoin and blockchain. Um, there is an analogy here that could be made between FTP and HTTP. So there's a story that at IBM, when somebody came up with, uh, yeah, we should be looking at HTTP, HTTP, they were making an experiment because technically some people said, well, HTTP is semantically nothing different. There's nothing different than uh, FT what FTP does. In the end, you get a file, right? That's, that's it. And so they gave them the task to write a web server. One guy was writing it in FTP, one was writing it in HTTP. And after a day, the guy with, for HTTP was done, and the guy with a FTP was, after a week, he was still not done. So they canceled the experiment, it had a clear result, and IBM started to look at HTTP. And this could be akin to the difference of having the stuff off-chain or having it on-chain because of various attack vectors that we've been speaking about this week, uh, these days. So Blue Horizon is something um, that informs very much how I look at the blockchain in the moment because it's uh, something we've been working on very hard and uh, we've also sometimes run into uh, uh, insights that maybe we hadn't hoped to find. What's Blue Horizon? Blue Horizon is doing analysis at the edge. That means that we are basically making it possible to have the analysis code running as close to the sensors and the edge as possible as opposed to having it in the cloud. So 
A very common situation is something like this. You have a lot of sensors. Th those are the bubbles at the top. And then those sensors, th they could be antennas for a software-defined radio or temperature or smoke detectors. They're sending a lot of data to the cloud. And that is very high volume data with a very low individual value that is then analyzed in the cloud to make high value out of it. So what we are striving to do is to reverse that and have, in the end, high value and low volume. So we are sending out the analysis code in, t in Docker containers to the edge. And at the edge, it's deployed, it's unpacked, and then it runs at the edge. And what it sends back is only the high value, low volume data. That's, in a nutshell, what we're doing. And you could be looking up uh, much more explanation. And you can even write your own applications on top of this platform. And this is the URL where you can go to and check out what Blue Horizon can do for you. We, will, we are in the process of open sourcing it. We are going to uh, uh, have, a very, uh, have a new website, too, where we're going to explain how, exactly how you write your platform. If you have a Raspberry Pi, you can immediately take part in the use cases that we're offering there. We're doing something emulating FlightAware. We're, um, you can have your own weather station plugged into our um, network. And what we have now is a map where you can see little uh, Raspberry Pis running all over the globe and picking up flight paths and uh, doing network speed tests. And you can immediately plug your Raspberry Pi in there and, and take part in this. And we're, we're happy about everybody and going to support you personally to come and take part. So part of the whole system that we have there is that we have a sequence that is going through registration of a Raspberry Pi in the network. Then it makes an offer, offering its data. Somebody else who's playing the entrepreneur or the use case is making a bid to have a subscription to this data stream to create a new business model format or uh, make a new offer. Then that bid is accepted. The functionality is deployed. The analyzation starts. And then in the end, there's payment. So out of these things, the deployment and the analyze, analyzing is something that we do completely peer-to-peer. -peer. We don't need the blockchain for that. And the reality is that even now, we're even taking the blockchain out of the equation for the offer and the bid and creating the centralized because it's just not scaling. It's just not fast enough at this point. And because we want to have a product that people can use, we're backtracking at that point. Um, if we're looking at smart contracts, ideally to have smart contracts full circle, you want to have something that goes like this. You, you have an offer. It is being, it's agreed to. Then at some point, you deliver the data. Thank you for the light show. <laughs> um, then, you, then at some point, you confirm, and then the payment comes. And what you really want to have to have a real smart contract is that the confirmation comes from a third-party trusted oracle. Or ideally, even you can have in Solidity code that verifies whether the data that has been delivered is really worth something. and then does the payment or a refund. This could be thinkable if you have weather data. You could verify whether it's a total outlier compared to its neighbors. Then it's probably noise, and then you don't pay. But the reality of it is, as it is right now, we're cutting this out. And what we're really using of smart contracts is only this, the offer, the agreement, and then in the end, you pay. And again, we have this gap there. So in a sad way, um, you could say that also at Blue Horizon, we're just using the blockchain very much as a distributed ledger. <laughs> And we are um, using it certainly for payment then in the end. But this is also because the reality of our project was that we have technology in search of a project and not the other way around. Um, and we were basically given a lot, lot of stuff that was supposed to be in that project. And this is why it was initially called MTN, or multiplying things needlessly. I want to share very quickly some problems that we found with Ethereum. And some of it is not so surprising. Speed is really standing out in a way that uh, can be pinpointed to it's the writes. How slow it is to write is, is, very, is, is exactly what making the problem. Scalability, I don't have to explain that. But of course, we ran into this. Somewhat unexpected, we really have huge bandwidth problems but are then, that are now healed more or less by the uh, light client. And then, of course, uh, yeah, scale. I said that before. So, and it's also a little bit too doge. I won't get into, into that. But sometimes there are idiosyncrasies that are fun for the guys who make it. But to use it, it's not, sometimes not helpful. Then we sometimes ran into bugs, too, that we felt like if somebody was really using Ethereum 
um, how can possibly be these bugs still in there? Uh, the strength, um, availability, that we have a contract language that you can actually use um, and to write complex and, and resilience. You can knock out all the nodes. If, no, if one node survives, it's still going to survive. But still, coming back to the DLT on uh, smart contract at parameterization, if you have functional programming, um, then you have first class citizen functions. And if you have a function, you just don't, you don't just throw static parameters in there. You want to have functions going in there. If this is a function and you have static parameters, you could, can define a cog. But if you can throw other functions in there, you can have a whole new universe of stuff happening just from one starting point. And so what you can do now is if you have an init function on, of our platform, you can give it a static parameter. And that's the price in this case. This could look like this. But if you have a little bit more, then you can have an acknowledgment function that is then called in the last uh, line out down there. And it's giving back a status to the app developer who's using our platform. Now you can even go faster and can have the whole my init function as part of the app instead of the platform. So it, the whole platform is calling back into the app. And now it gets interesting because you can also, of course, get beyond the whole convention of having an init function. You could do it like this. Or in the future, you could also uh, hope that you would at some point have the possibility to have this, which is exactly what uh, Christian said today, when Solidity comes to the point that it actually allows you to have first class citizen functions. Um, this syntax does not exist yet, but this would allow you to set the price immediately by a callback that would say, check out what the price of the dollar is at a certain day to set a price that is not a static number, but that is looked up in that moment. So yeah, this is just a <laughs> the distributed ledger. Uh, I really hate it, but maybe there's more to it than I used to think, and this is just the current thoughts I had on it. This is my Twitter handle. Uh, I'll post the links there. Thank you very much.